Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants, and today we're going to be doing a lesson all about bananas. In this video, we're going to be harvesting a variety of bananas known as the Manzano, also known as the apple variety of bananas, and come in and see if we can zoom in a little closer. I'm going to give you a tour of all the varieties of bananas we have here in the garden. Come check these out. Before we go to harvesting the bananas behind me, let me just quickly give you a tour of the varieties of bananas I've got growing on right now on my property. Check this out. So this cluster over here is the Manzano, again that apple variety of bananas. As you can see here, the parent plant is this structure which is right here growing in that direction and it's surrounded by all of these oversized pups. We're gonna talk about in this video about controlling pup size so that it'd be easier for propagation. But these have grown almost as large as the parent plant itself and that's gonna pose a problem as you're gonna to see towards the end of this video. What I've got over here is the Goldfinger variety of banana. And um, as you can see, this is um, starting to grow. And this is now about two years old. And it's, a, and it's only this height. And the reason is, as well, for the smaller size is it's getting drowned by light by the Manzano variety. And secondly, there's a specific microclimate that's happening on this side of my property, which is the south side of my garden that's not happening on the north side of my garden, where I've got all my citrus trees that are in full sun year round my south side of the garden is in the shade at least two to three months out of the year. So um, you need to consider a microclimate. And as we talk about introducing a new banana plant to this um, garden as well, towards the end of this video with, with your help, um, we have to take microclimate in consideration. We're gonna be talking about that in just a second. And come follow me a little closer. And then this guy here is the famous ice cream or java banana. We've had this in our garden now for three years, maybe a little more. We've enjoyed so far two harvests of about 60 pounds each of bananas off of this variety. This here is one of the suckers remaining from the parent plant that's behind me. And the grandparent before that is also underneath this as well. Um, on average, the, um, this compost pile that was generated from itself um, basically gets recycled back into the garden. Be, by the time um, it's cut down, typically within about three to four months, about 80 to 90 percent of this has broken down into the soil, um, feeding all of the life and microorganisms that exist um, beneath these plants. And that helps rejuvenate and return all of the elements that went into that parent plant into these sucker plants to create another amazing and highly productive banana. Well, let's get started now. So I brought with me today five lessons that I want to make sure I teach you guys before the end of this video. And the first lesson we're going to discuss is how to best harvest your bananas. And the coolest thing ever is I learned this from you guys. From having watched my um, video number one on harvesting bananas and video number two on harvesting bananas, um, let me just quickly share with you what happened in those videos um, and I'll explain to you what the faults were with each of them. Check this out. The banana plant behind me is the uh, goldfinger variety and then to my left is the apple variety and those beautiful tropical flowers that I've got behind that look like bananas are in fact haliconias to kind of add to the tropical look that we're doing here in the garden. Um, take a look at those beautiful um, red flowers behind me. So when we installed, this is of the bananas in our garden, the smallest being the Goldfinger variety of bananas, this too will grow at least 10, 15 feet or so. Um, so it'll also be a large banana variety as will the apple variety of banana that we've got. When we installed it, the first thing we did since we planted in the middle of summer is we sprayed it with the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Spray. And if you come in a little closer, and I'll share the label with you after, you can see that this one has probably had at least two if not three coats, um, more so for demonstration purposes. But this here you can see down below is still faded and this was probably applied at least three if not six months ago and it's still offering the plant protection from sunburn. And then these upper leaves do not have any protection at all as now the plant's established. But if we know that we're gonna have a record heat wave that may damage the plant, 
we may then want to also reapply the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard where it's a ready to use um, spray on trunk branches and leaves, protection against damaging sunburn and insects and rodents. For newly installed plants and trees, for use under roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs. And what this product has in addition to offering the sunblock is it's got these seven natural oils, um, castor, cinnamon, clove, cedarwood, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, to also protect it from damaging insects that may um, harm the plants as well to get it off to a great start. So by applying the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard at the time of installation, that'll help minimize the sun stress and the heat stress to get your plants off to a great start at the time of transplant. That applies for your bananas as well as all your other fruit trees, ornamental trees, roses, and shrubs. Uh, another way to also purchase the product is by the can, and this here is the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard, also registered material for use in organic agriculture. Um, but this here you can actually add water to it and use it as a brush on, as well as a foliar spray and also a tree paste. If Let's get to harvesting. So here we are in the cluster of bananas. The ice cream banana is also known as the blue java. And the reason is the green bananas typically have a bluish hue to them. Um, I don't know if you can capture that in the video or not, but take a look at those green bananas. And we're gonna now harvest one. I wanna taste one before we harvest the whole thing while we're up here on the vine. So here we go. We've waited such a long time for this. Here we go. Let's open it together. Here we go. I definitely get why this is called the ice cream banana. You can definitely taste the vanilla in it. It's so cool. Let's now harvest the entire bunch. I'm just going to remove this like so. What? I could support these bananas with just one hand. I just weighed them. It weighs a little over 60 pounds of bananas. Let's go and support them now in the structure behind us. Follow me. And here we go. I might want to put another tie into it to secure it. It's a lot of weight. Um, but check these out. There's a few bananas I got damaged along the way and just handling it. We're going to take those in first and start enjoying them. And they recommend when storing your bananas to put them in a shady, cool place, preferably outdoors, to allow them to naturally ripen on its vine. Pretty impressive stuff, huh? Momentarily. But unlike last year when we harvested our ice cream bananas, they were a lot lower. As I work my way and I've attached this ladder to the tree, um, or to the banana plant behind me, but as I approach the near height, you can see that the banana is still way higher. Um, I would guess that we're about somewhere between 18 to 22 feet up in the air right here with um, where these bananas are. So um, it's reached a record height here in the garden, um, and we gotta find a way to get these down. So I'm gonna work on doing that right now. Check out the beautiful blooms of the ice cream banana and what it looked like as this one bloomed this year in the month of August. Another important point to share with you is that on average, it'll tell you from bloom to ripe bananas is on average 90 days. But here we are from that first week of August when this bloomed through August, September, October, November, December, January, and here we are now that first week of February, it took just about seven months to enjoy these bananas. So um, the factor in what's different about the research that says 90 days and what's actually happening here in my Los Angeles garden is that there's microclimates. And this section of my garden that's um, on this line and behind me is one of the shadiest and one of the coolest parts of my garden. Had I planted it about another five or 10 feet to my right or heading in the north direction, it would have received the additional light and the additional warm temperatures that would have shortened the ripening period. Well, check out these flowers now.
So I've just cut at this height over here, starting to crack. I'm gonna try to catch the fall here. Here it goes. Here it goes, here it goes, here it goes. If you come in a little closer, you'll see that it really missed the ground by less than an inch. Check this out over here. If I can just sway it, look at that. It's literally less than an inch away from the ground. It didn't hit. It's, um, I hope you guys can come up with a better way to harvesting these tall bananas. And again, my gardening practices where the trees are all about, you know, eight to 10 feet apart. Um, it was a true challenge. So let's see. So in the first video you saw that I pretty much tried holding on to the banana as I use my saw, and this is the only tool I'm gonna to be using today as well, but I basically held on to that banana bunch while I sawed it, and um, 60 pounds was just too much to hold on to with just one hand. Maybe some of you guys can do it, but I don't recommend it. And then in the second video, what I did was, I basically went about halfway up the banana stalk, which is right here behind me, if I can move the ladder. Um, so if I went halfway up and cut here, when the plant folds in half, those bananas are gonna be on the ground. So one of you suggested, and I love the idea, was why don't you cut it up about three fourths of the way up the ground, so when that top third falls over, the banana bunch should be closer to halfway, and that should be within reach, that I can then cut off the bananas and harvest them. So let's see if that works. This is lesson number one, is how to best harvest your banana bunch. I'm sure a lot of you guys have bananas, and hopefully um, will benefit from harvesting your bananas in this manner. So let's get started. Here we go. Let's check this out. Success, I would say that idea worked. So for all of you guys propagating next time you know, go about three quarters up the plant, make your cut. Unfortunately, it's stressing out my little gold finger banana, so let's try to get this out of the way. But check out these bananas real quick. How beautiful is that? One other quick point I wanna make. The Manzano banana um, variety, this is now entering its second year. And when it comes to fruit, um, and I'm hoping for those of you that see the Manzano, this is probably not the best representation of the plant. As again, um, it went through firstly the stress of having some rot that was happening in the center of that banana plant. We even did a video on this um, in spring or summer of last year where we basically did a solution of neem oil to basically cure whether it was maggots or caterpillars that were consuming the center part of the banana plant. Um, after we did that within um, the following weeks, it pushed out new leaves that were gorgeous. And a, a, about a couple months after that, it pushed out its bloom. And here are the fruits. But again, those stresses may have compromised the quality and the size of the fruit. So again, don't judge the plant in the first year. Um, and we're not gonna judge it. And also I haven't had breakfast, so I'm very looking forward to tasting it and sharing with you the, the, the results. So here we go. So here they are, let's go put them in the light. So here we are, the Manzano bananas. And let's taste one now. So let's sample now one of these Manzano bananas. Check this out, if you're coming a little closer. It's a beautiful fruit, even though they're super tiny. I think a healthier plant would have produced larger bananas, but take a look at that. I can tell you this, it tastes way better than the Chiquita banana at your store. Um, definitely worth keeping, um, and it has definitely earned a spot on my property, even though it looks pitiful. Um, I'm hoping to prove to you in the next year or two that as these plants get established, and again, don't judge your tree based on that first year performance, and even that second year performance. And Judy, who was with us here in our garden just a few weeks ago from Judy's Homegrown, she even said you might have to give your fruit trees up to five years to truly appreciate that maximum flavor and the maximum productivity um, of your plant. So 
don't judge it by year one. Don't even judge it by year two, according to Judy, but even wait until that fifth year. Um, my patients wouldn't typically run that long, but if all my bananas tasted like this, um, I would actually keep it. That's awesome. So the next step after harvesting a banana is to secure the green bananas in a cool, dry place on your property. So we're just going to be securing that up in place like so. Working around this grapevine and we'll enjoy the yellow bananas as they ripen. The green ones will turn within the next um, few days up to the next couple of weeks and we'll get to enjoy some fresh bananas every day all that are going to become surplus if there is any surplus off this little bunch um, but when we had 60 pounds of bananas we ended up with a lot of surplus that ended up in the freezer so we just basically peeled them and prepared them ready for use and put them in the freezer we've been enjoying those as excellent desserts in the evenings um, let's get on to the next point so when it comes to the parent plant which is this central part of the um, banana plant which supported the fruit, um, the goal is to now basically prune it down to about half the height, maybe even keep it at that three quarter height. And the goal is all of the nutrients will naturally break down and work their way back into the soil. And you leave it like that for at least a month to a few months. And then if for cosmetic purposes you want to you know, bring it back down to the ground, you can bring it back to the um, ground. And all the prior videos, we typically prune it about one to a few couple of inches above the ground to make sure that um, that heart of the crown is not exposed to all the soil microbiology um, and isn't exposed to all of those pathogens that can then enter the crown possibly um, resulting in rot to some of the healthy um, suckers or these pups as they're known or daughter plants that are surrounding the central parent. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna bring it down to um, about six feet and that's what I've decided and here we go. And the goal again when pruning it is to cut it at an angle to make sure that if there's any rainfall, not that there's much here in Southern California, but that when it gets any moisture that it washes right off rather than if it was a flat cut, the water would pool at the top. And here we are now. This is the top of the parent plant. Um, another question I get from a lot of you guys is, is there any way of saving the parent plant? Can you harvest the fruit and then revive the plant to produce another flower and fruit? And the answer is no. So um, it is essential for the quality and the health of your plant and the future generations of fruit that you make sure you remove the parent plant so that the energy and resources and all your fertilizer go to benefit the surrounding suckers that you decide to keep. You don't wanna keep all of them either. We're going to get to that next. So lesson number two that I want to make a really good point on is controlling the pup size. The reason for controlling the pup size is so that when you decide which pups you're going to keep and which ones you're going to give away to your friends and, and family, um, that you've got something that's manageable in size. The bad part here is I've got a lot of pups. That's actually a good thing, but the bad part is they're so big. They're going to be hard to put in containers. They're going to be hard to transplant. They're going to be hard to manage because they got so big. You should always allow maybe one or two of the pups or even three. If the goal is you're going to end up keeping three of the pumps, pups remaining, at least you've got now a nice large plant that will be very close to blooming and fruiting again in this year, which we expect out of some of the larger pups. But um, we've allowed too many pups to exist. In fact, let's see how many pups we've got, starting with this one over here, if we can call this one number one. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pups that were created by this one parent banana plant. So now we've got seven pups to manage and um, it's recommended that at most you allow only three pups to exist in any given year. So you can have up to three pups turning into three parent plants producing three loads of fruit with each plant you can actually have three giant bunches of bananas um, per year. In my smaller garden, my goal is to only control one to two bananas at a time so that I can plant my bananas a little bit more dense. As you can see between my Manzano apple variety 
and my gold finger variety, you can see that they're only a matter of a couple of feet apart. I'm allowing these things to you know, coexist with one another. I know I'm compromising a little bit on volume um, of fruit I can otherwise enjoy, but my goal is to have diversification and to have flavors and not just enjoy one variety of banana as we're still also trying to learn which bananas thrive and do best here in this garden. So what we're gonna do in regards to controlling the size of the banana pup in the future, what you could, could have been doing along the way, if you knew you wanted to harvest a banana pup and it's just far too large to manage, and this one here is manageable, but this one over here is a little bit too large and it's going in the wrong direction. It's coming out towards um, our property or towards our patio or concrete patio area. And the goal is to keep the pups, and we're gonna talk about the crown next, but the goal is to keep it back into the original place where we once started. As you can see, when it was just one plant, it was only consuming about two square feet of area. But now that it's seven plants, it's consuming a good nine square feet of area. And if each of these pups continue making more pups around it, eventually it can have a giant crown and a giant mass of bananas that's just in too large of an area. We're gonna be talking about controlling that in part three of this video, but let's, um, let me show you just how to control size. This pup's definitely coming out, and I wanna make this point with this particular pup that this pup is infringing or growing towards this variety of banana, the Goldfinger banana. And these two, being that they're competitors for sunlight, and sunlight is the catalyst for making more leaves, growing, root structure, root formation, and ultimately the goal is to have quality, healthy fruit. But this banana is in the way, and what we're gonna do to simply make smaller pups for propagation is we're going to bring it down like so. So this plant comes out. If we come in a little closer now, I have not killed this banana. In fact, um, the reason the bananas are not called banana trees, but instead the banana plants is that it'll continue to grow. Like this is not a, 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 a plant's trunk. It simply pushes out more leaves from the center. Within the next week or two, there'll be more leaves coming out the center. And I'll now have a smaller pup for managing, for repotting, for replanting, and for controlling. So I took that out of the way again. The goal being I've now increased the amount of light and space between the two plants simply by bringing it down. Um, the next lesson that we're gonna talk about here is gonna be now controlling the crown. And before we talk about that, I've gotta decide which pups are gonna exist and which ones are gonna be removed for giving away to friends and family. Um, and again, the larger ones, if they're just too hard to manage, unfortunately, we're gonna to have to dispose of, but nothing goes to waste because all of the plant material you'll see will be recycled back into the garden preferably around the banana plants, just as we did with that ice cream banana that I shared with you at the beginning of the video, where we pretty much surround the plant with its own parts, and that basically breaks down and refeeds the plant in the next generation. So let's decide which suckers we're gonna keep. Let me think about this. So I've narrowed it down. I'm actually gonna allow this variety of bananas to have up to three pups. We counted seven, so that means four of them are coming out. The first one I wanna share with you to make this lesson on controlling the crown size is we're gonna remove this um, sucker that's right here behind me. Um, the way we're gonna start off is we're first gonna cut it down and then we're gonna break the crown, um, basically pushing the banana plant back into position rather than allowing it to grow towards our deck and our concrete deck. Possibly, um, you know, if this was thin enough, it could possibly lead to cracking. Um, and, and basically even overgrowing. It'll ruin the aesthetics and the beauty within the garden as well. Um, being, I want everything to be managed and controlled and in its respective um, position, at least in this garden. For some people, more of that wild jungle look might be the preference as well. And in that sense, just let it go. Um, but here we go. Check out how easy it is to um, bring these um, down. Simply using this handsaw. Come check this out. Here we go. When it comes to the leaves, you can simply just use a paper scissor and prune those out of the way.
And now what we're gonna do is remove this pup and sever it from the crown. We're gonna allow this smaller, younger sucker to remain, and we're gonna allow this larger um, sucker to also remain behind it. And there's a third one on this side that we're gonna keep, and those will be the three. I would expect at least two of the larger ones to flower and fruit this year. The younger one might, um, might just be the structure that'll be the large um, plant that'll go into next year. So that's the plant. Now we're gonna remove this. Let's get our hands on a shovel. So here we are. We're simply gonna take our shovel. We're gonna position this behind the sucker, hoping it can capture that. And the goal is we're going to now break the crown. The crown being the parent plant with all of the suckers around it. We're gonna to try to make it a smaller crown by removing it. Keep in mind, we do not do any of these methods or disrupt the crown at all while the plants are flowering or fruiting as this will, again, add stress, possibly compromise the health and the life of the plant. So again, now that we harvested the fruit, this is my favorite time for managing the banana structure. Check that out. So here, we've just brought down this sucker, huge sucker. Take a look at all of these other little bananas also. And we could plant this and gain the benefits of some bananas, whether it be this plant returning back from, you know, to life or the root ball will support another sucker that can create some more Manzano ice cream bananas. Let's continue. Here's another one. Take a look here in the light. Right there, another baby banana sucker, or another pup on its way. And here's another one right, actually there's some more roots. So again, this here can be planted as well. When storing them, store them in a cool, um, shaded place. Do not leave them in the sun. In the meantime, I'm gonna cover these with some leaves. And I'm just gonna finish this up. So now we're simply gonna, again, using our paper scissors, we're gonna remove any leaves that are crisscrossing. You may leave some, again, for the natural effect, but I'm just cleaning up these plants after having gone through this main, major stress. This leaf was all twisted and mangled, so we'll get that out of the way. This leaf over here is only a half a leaf. So we'll cut that out of the way. You can see how beautiful this is gonna look as soon as we clean it up. I'm going to take off some of these lower leaves. We can keep this guy, we'll remove this one. Do the same back here. Any brown, you would take it off. That was actually another question a lot of you asked. Can I remove some of the damage in, in brown leaves? The brown leaves, yes, but if there's any damaged leaves, again, while there's fruit on your plant, you don't remove any of those, um, especially if it's on the parent. 
If it's on a sucker or one of those pups, sure you can remove some of the damaged leaves, but do not do so on your parent plant. Um, and now we've pretty much narrowed it down. I'm hoping if you can take a couple, first let's take a look real close. We've got um, one, two, and three pups, three suckers. These will now all inherit the crown as being the future parents. And this here is the late parent that just gave us that excellent bunch of bananas. We'll leave it here, like I said, for the next month or two. And then we can bring it down to the ground again, pruning it just about a couple of inches off the ground. Um, and then we're gonna have this beautiful um, three-part banana. Um, the other thing too that I noticed, and this is also part of our lesson, lesson number four, is to make sure that the plants have an upright centered position. Um, as you can see with the goldfinger variety of bananas, it has been leaning for quite some time because of all of the light that's been taken away by the manzana behind me. So with this goldfinger variety of bananas, I wanna make sure it's not leaning due to its um, competition for light. When it supports the fruit, it's gonna lean even more. So if I can get it more centered now, um, and I can get the roots to support an upright habit, the better it will flower, the better it will fruit, the better it will perform. Um, so I'm gonna secure that right now. When securing your bananas, and whether it's any other fruit trees on your property, when it comes to securing them, you're gonna to want to decide on if you're gonna use something like this, which is a very thin nylon string, or if you're gonna use something thicker. And this one over here, I even got the description of. It's a quarter inch, 100 feet long um, nylon blend string. And if you take a look at it, it's really soft and it's a lot thicker. Um, the thicker the rope, the more gentle the rope, um, the better for your plant so it doesn't cut into the plant as your trees swing against the rope. And if it's thinner, it ha it's more likely to cut into your plants. Again, this applies to any other of your other fruit trees, um, and especially now with your bananas being such tender plants on the outside. So what we're gonna do is, I'm simply going to secure this rope to that fence that's to my left or towards your right. What we're gonna do is secure the rope to the fence, and then I'm going to put a tie around this. I'm gonna be careful as in all the other lessons to make sure we don't tie against the plant, or we're gonna create a loose noose and then basically pull it and tie it against the fence. So let's get started with that real quick. So here we are now. I just secured the rope to the fence. We got a knot right there on our um, neighboring property's fence. And what we're gonna do now is cut the rope. I'm giving myself some slack, because I'm gonna, you'll see why in just a moment. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna wrap around, and you'll notice that this leaf on the gold finger got damaged, I'm keeping it, I'm not pruning it quite yet. It's still mostly attached to the, um, the gold finger plant and it's still doing its job of collecting sugars, making sugars and supporting the health and the life of the plant. The plant will immediately produce more leaves as you can see here. Um, I'm just leaving this for the next week or two while hopefully this pushes out another nice open leaf and then I'll prune it out. Um, but again, for now I'm just keeping it being such a young plant. And so what I've done is I've just wrapped gently around the plant. Again, no knots against the, um, the plant you're securing. Actually, never put a knot against any of your plants and trees. As the plant expands, that knot can constrict the, the flow of juices and stuff. So we're gonna do that. I'm now gonna create a pulley system by wrapping it around that parent plant. Again, this is now dead, right? We just um, removed the bananas from it. And you can see I'm now straightening the gold finger a little bit more and a little bit more and we're good and now I'll just secure the knot in place but you can see I've completely improved the um, position of the gold finger banana by straining it so that when it flowers and supports fruit, it'll be more in the upright position for a much longer period of time, which is optimal. And now I'll tie the knot. Keep in mind, I just said you'll never tie a knot against any of your trees or your bananas, but again, I'm tying the knot against the dead parent plant, and this one's in the process of decaying now, so um, I'm just using this 
within the next few weeks, this plant will be in the upright position and its entire system can be removed. That's my lesson on straightening and uprighting your plants within your garden. Let's get on to the last point. So now we're in the final step. I've secured a beautiful sized pup. I want to repot that with you real quick right now. Um, we're going to start off with this product over here, which is Gary's Best Top Pot. And the reason we're using this, and we've learned from um, Gary at the Laguna Hills Nursery, um, which is right at the intersection of the 5 and the 22 and the um, 55 freeways. And I'll put the video link at the end of this so you can learn directly from Gary why this is the best potty mix, but I can share with you right now that the benefit is it's a permanent soil. It's closer to a permanent soil than pretty much any other potty mixes that are on the market as most of the potty mixes that are on the market have a lot of organic material that breaks down, decays, and basically allows that soil structure to collapse. This one over here has a lot more um, you know, um, structures and components in it that are not made from plants and manure that'll break down but rather derive from other sources of rock and minerals that will basically hold and maintain the integrity while supporting a good healthy plant. So what we're going to do is we're just going to put Gary's Top Pot here in this container. Typically you would add about a nice inch of medium sized rocks to the bottom to continuously help with drainage and then we're going to add the potting soil on top of that. So I've gone up about halfway. Depending on the size of the pup, you might want to go higher or smaller or larger container or smaller container. But this being a large pup, I'm using a five gallon container. We're going to put the pup here like so and you can take a look at all of those roots. So we're going to put that there in the container. And now we're going to continue filling it up. So I'm basically filling up the soil to about the top um, quarter inch to a half an inch to the top. I'm now going to also compress the soil to make sure that the roots are in contact with soil. You want to make sure again that root is in contact with soil and not air pockets that can otherwise dry out the roots and again compromise the health and the life of this plant. So we're going to add a little more soil now after compressing it, it's collapsed a little bit. So we're going to add some more. And the next step is water. You're going to want to make sure you soak the plant. So we're going to allow that water to sit. As the water soaks into the, um, the pot, we'll continuously add more water to it to make sure it's fully hydrated. What we're going to do next is we're just going to go with our scissors and we're going to prune these leaves in half. And the goal is, is to minimize desiccation or drying out by the plant. If it's got a small amount of roots and some huge leaves, all that water in the plant is going to dry out. So the goal is to minimize all of that water loss. So again, we're going to cut these leaves in half, cut these leaves in half, and cut these leaves in half. And then hopefully the center leaf will remain and grow to become a, the first complete leaf of the plant. But if you see any withering or dying happening within the plant, you may need to cut this one in half as well, the newest leaf. Now that the water's dried out, We'll add some more water. And now for the last step here, we're going to use this ready to use spray. This here is the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard ready to use spray protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents. And um, the reason we're using it real quick, I just saw this brochure, is the protection as a sun blocker, as a sunscreen, basically preventing summer sunburn. Um, it also offers the benefits of anti-transparent. The goal is you want to make sure that uh, all of that sun that's beating up on this plant, today's an 80 degree, 85 degree day, we want to make sure the plant doesn't wilt and stress in the sun. So what we're going to do is we're going to add this organic sun block to the plant. It's basically a process of whitewashing. So we're going to spray all of the leaves and I'm going to spray the trunk as well. Espe especially the south facing side of the plant, that's going to be the hottest um, side of the plant, which in this example is going to be this side of the tree right now as the sun is in this direction and will be setting in that direction. So this side of the plant will be the hottest side. 
And that's it. If you can come in a little closer, you can see those drops of the organic white ivory organic sun green. If you've enjoyed this educational moment by our very organics, be sure to like us and most importantly by subscribing below you'll be connected to this and all of our other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching and happy gardening. For those of you that have made it to the end, I've got a quick question to ask. I've found room for a fourth variety of bananas here in the garden. So far we've got again just to recap the ice cream variety, the apple variety or the manzano and then we've also got the gold finger. So if there was room for one more banana in your garden, um, what would you recommend? And I'm looking forward to your feedback. If you can write me in the comments down below, that would be wonderful. In the meantime, I'm gonna enjoy these teeny Manzano bananas. And again, with the hope that I'm gonna have some larger Manzano bananas in the years to come. Um, and really looking forward to your feedback and all of your support um, is really appreciated. Thank you guys so much. And again, happy gardening. Cheers.